Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the program. You're watching The Voice of the Northwest Suburbs, Andrew Richter, the television show. Always a pleasure to have you tuning in. Every Thursday night, Channel 19, 6 p.m. replayed at 10 a, uh, wait a minute, 2 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Friday. Yeah, four years of this show, and I finally got the times down. Well, uh, as you've been watching over the last couple of months, we've been having uh, various candidates uh, running to represent you here in the northwest suburbs at various levels of government. Uh, everybody from people running for Congress to county to legislature, they're all breaking down the door to get on the program. And we have one last show to do on the candidates here in local office. And I want to introduce running for state senate in District 45, Blair Tremere, to the program. Blair, welcome. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate, uh, appreciate yeah. the opportunity to be here with you. Good, great to have you. Why don't you take a minute and uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, who are you, why you're running, and uh, all that fun stuff. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I've been involved in uh, local government primarily for most of my career, and almost all of it has been in the northwest suburbs, either mm -hmm. Plymouth or Brooklyn Center. Uh, I've been a uh, self-employed consultant in public affairs and I've also had the opportunity to work for the uh, House of Representatives uh, on the Tax Committee as a Committee Administrator and the Metropolitan and Local Government Committee uh, back in the uh, 1990s and at the turn of the century. Uh, finally, believe it or not, and we can get into this later, uh, I was asked or offered a position at the Metropolitan Council and uh, I think they hired me because for many years I'd been known as somewhat of a rock thrower when I worked at the city of Plymouth. <laughs> and uh, they figured, well, now was the time for me to be on the other side of it and see how I could do there. So I had a successful uh, two and a half year uh, stint as the director of uh, community development at the Metro Council. So I've had Metro and state, and I even had a year and a half as an aide to the, uh, one of the county commissioners. So I've, I'm a political government type of guy. I'm proud of it. It's a noble profession. And now I'm pretty much retired from that, and uh, I'm doing volunteer work in the city of Golden Valley, Community Foundation, for instance, and uh, some other volunteer-oriented work, and uh, consulting. And uh, this time around, last spring, it became apparent that uh, no one had uh, made the move to uh, run against the incumbent uh, senator uh, from this district. She's been in the legislature, uh, Senator Rest has been in the legislature uh, 28 years, I believe, 10, yeah. 10 of it in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I don't hold that against her. I thank her for her service. But, you know, this is the opportunity the citizens have. This is it, where at an election like this, happens to be a presidential election too, uh, where citizens can decide if they want to try something different or move to someone else or, or they let the incumbent know that they're not satisfied with the service they've been getting. So I decided to make the move. And uh, as you know, I... Uh, ran uh, in a primary this last summer and I won in August. Uh, that's always fun, campaigning in uh, June and July. Yeah, it was only about uh, <laughs> only 110 degrees or so out, right. wasn't it? But yeah. you, you lose some weight and yeah. uh, get in shape <laughs> and you get to meet a lot of people uh, in, in that atmosphere of summertime recreation. Uh, people aren't really thinking politics mm -hmm. and election. But uh, nevertheless, we've been campaigning now more aggressively uh, into the fall and uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, I love door knocking, and I need to tell the story that my first move into politics actively uh, was I ran for mayor of my fair city, Golden Valley, against an incumbent, and I won. And I attribute very much to what I won as not only just issues, but I knocked on doors, a lot of doors, maybe most of the doors in Golden Valley. Uh, it's a little t tougher to do that on a Senate district-wide basis because of its size. <laughs> But uh, I enjoyed that, and uh, later I ran for uh, and was elected to the City Council of Golden Valley as well. Okay. Uh, I've had some other elections I've run in and didn't quite succeed, but uh, so never, never so you're not I've been you're not there. new to the to the the game, no, are you? I love it. it it's good. <laughs> well, some people it's in their blood. I think it's in my blood. I right. think it's in your blood. Right. Well, now in running for the Senate, um, if you look at the last legislative session and. Uh, it's been a big topic here on my show, and I'm sure it's a motivator for you. You know, right. we had the government shutdown last year. We had right. the whole, you know, hodgepodge brouhaha to get that done. Then we had kind of a session this year that ended in a Viking stadium and things like right. that. What do you, what's your take on 
what's going on in the legislature, what's working, what's not. Um, you know, just as a citizen, what do you what do you think about what's going on in St. Paul right now? I think that the uh, legislature and the administration, state government particularly, but federal government too probably, but let's just talk about the state, mm -hmm. uh, has become somewhat aloof and remote from what they're really all about and that's serving the people of their district and the people of the state. I think that there's been a great move toward more influence by special interest groups, political action groups, uh, large unions and so on to the point where a lot of the, the real needs and so on of the people are filtered through them and are not directly felt. Now, people can argue differently, and especially maybe in the rural districts, but my experience in the Twin Cities has been that there's that remoteness and aloofness. Uh, I think that's led to situations where you have what I'll call a Mexican standoff that resulted in the so-called shutdown, <laughs> and that's nothing to be proud of. Uh, any more than we should be proud of the United States Senate not passing a budget for how many years now? Three, Three four. at least, yeah. That's shameful because that's mm. one of the fundamental things they should be doing. But I'm an optimist, and as a citizen, uh, I look at that shutdown, and I have the benefit of hindsight now, but even when it was occurring, uh, if you notice what was coming out and what was in the press, maybe under the radar a little bit, but what was interesting is that as we shut down, there was a real learning experience there, which should have taught a lot of people, especially more conservative folks like me, smaller government advocates like me, look at the problems that came to the surface when employees weren't able to go to work because of the shutdown. In other words, the doors were closed, they were shut out, and some of them were just ludicrous. The, the infamous one, of course, was beer sales almost had to come to a grinding halt <laughs> because of the lack of a piece of paper and a certificate because some bureaucrat wasn't there at the office to issue it to him. Shows you how big and how government's in every nook and cranny, yeah, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Canterbury Downs had to stop ra racing because mm. a bureaucrat couldn't be on the premises. It had nothing to do with veterinarians or anything else. It had to do with the fact that the way the law was written, there needed to be somebody from the, the uh, uh, gaming board or gambling board, uh, the appropriate body, mm -hmm. to be there. Now, you know, I understand the need for regulation. That's not my point here. My, my point is, on an optimistic note, the shutdown showed us, to some extent, these areas where we really felt the pinch. And I think the good news is, some of our fundamental things weren't really shut down. They might have been and it continued, but we weren't lacking for public safety. The prisons kept operating, mm. and some of those fundamental things, especially things that are more in the local government realm and not the state. In fact, if it maybe showed us anything was how little the state really does do on a day-to-day -day basis, despite <laughs> what it would have us think it does. Well, no wonder it ended then. They don't want us to see that, do they? Well, that's <laughs> right. Now, it's not a proud moment when you get to get yeah. to that point, but I think once in a while for something like that to occur probably is the kind of jolt that I would think legislators would take to heart and say, what really happened when we had that shutdown? Not that the shutdown is the issue anymore, that the issue is let's examine those things that happened because maybe some of that could be corrected and hopefully we'll never have a shutdown again. Well, hopefully they got an earful when they went home. Right? I, I would hope so. 